Hello, I am Susan Engels. I am part of the Edenton Racial Reconciliation Group, and I'm so pleased to welcome you to the Lesser Known History of Edenton Lecture Series, which is made possible by our partners, the Shepherd Pruden Memorial Library and the Edenton Historical Commission. We thank them both. And I also want to thank Dr. Benjamin Speller, who is our lecturer for this, for today. He is a native son, and in his long academic, and academic career, he has played a pivotal role in preserving history in our state and in our region, especially African American cultural history. And his academic work focused not only on library and information science, but also on history, explaining to generations of us how we got to where we are, which is what he'll be doing today. Thank you, Ben. Thank you. The reason that I, I selected the topic Juan colonization 1619-1750, and uh, I'm also going to focus not only on just the events, but the relationships uh, that were very important to the development of what is now Eastern North Carolina, or North Carolina at that time. As you all know that, uh, might not know, uh, Juwan County started out as a part of Albemarle County, and at that time Albemarle was the county, and Chawan was a precinct in that uh, geographical location, and was the largest uh, area uh, in the uh, the precinct. Um, in, uh, in 1722, um, they started dividing when they were developing more of North Carolina. And so Bertie County was a precinct in the Chawan County, and it then became a county, which automatically reduced the size of Chawan County to its present day geographical location and made Bertie County, at that point in time, 1722, the one of the largest counties in North Carolina, even up to today. Uh, out of that county, you now have Hall parts of Halifax, you have uh, Northampton County, you have uh, Hertford County, and, and parts of what is now Gates County was even uh, Bertie County. And I'm taking the time to say that because of the fact that as I discuss this today, you will uh, realize, if you're from this area, why we have a lot of surnames and families that are in Chawan County and all of the other three counties and so forth because they were, this was a very large geographical spread and people didn't stay in place. They just moved around uh, as they obtained land for farming and so forth. I'll get back and talk more about that. What I decided to do was to have before you some points that I can use as guiding. Uh, I thought I would start out by acknowledging the presence of the Algonquin tribes, especially the Tuscarora, that were here in the area. And uh, they had a heavy interaction uh, with the first uh, colonists that came here. And they were primarily in what is now Bertie County. And they were there until uh, 1712. Um, Many of the European traders uh, accepted Indian wives. Uh, the uh, Caucasian children, as a result of these marriages, became some of the most successful merchants in early America. And most people do not realize that uh, they are here because they were probably the first people that used the surnames of their fathers. Uh, um, uh, the Native Americans did not have uh, surnames uh, I followed the English culture. Uh, so these Trangerian were 
became the important guides and uh, learned all of the secret uh, pathways from what is now North Carolina, on, even on out to California and various areas. They, trade, they, they learned how to be traders and were hired by the Europeans as guides. And I thought that was important for you to know uh, because sometimes you don't see that in history. Now, the next one deals with uh, the fact that uh, I thought that you would be interested in knowing that most of the people that came here into the area uh, were from England and from uh, the Scottish Highlands. So you do have not only English, but you have Highland Scots here. Most people think they are up in the mountains somewhere, but I have news for you. They were here first. Um, in 1650, in that area, uh, we had uh, most uh, British uh, people were in Virginia, and as they uh, came in and stayed a few years, uh, they started migrating into what is now North Carolina, it's eastern North Carolina. And they were primarily fur trappers, which is getting back to the first statement that I made. And uh, this is considered the borderland. Uh, so we'll say that they chiefly settled in the Albemarle borderland region, which includes uh, Bertie and um, Northampton County and some of the others. One thing I do want to mention is that it was as late as the uh, 1900s or the, uh, the almost the 20th century when some of the uh, line, border lines and so forth finally got resolved between Virginia and uh, North Carolina. So uh, people used to say at the legislature that you all are still living in Virginia and we always would get a little annoyed with them for that. But I thought you might be interested in hearing that. The other thing that I do want to mention here, and I will spend some, a little bit more time on this, is the fact that more than half of all white immigrants to the English colonists uh, during the 17th and 18th centuries were indentured servants. And that most of the English colony uh, who were indentured servants were white males between the age of 14 and, and 19. Uh, they said 22, uh, so they were adults by that time. But we will say that they started out here as white teenagers. Now, what is the implication for that being important? You did not have that many uh, white females here in the area. And these white males were usually assigned to the three or 400 acres uh, to help develop uh, what is now some of the plantations. And so, what they would do is find Native American wives, and they even went further than that. Um, Edenton was one of the major was one of the major uh, areas that uh, when slavery started, slaves started coming in, and most people do not realize that these young men would come here and seek wives from among uh, the slaves. So some of them would uh, get the owner to buy a slave to be his, uh, his cook. They would have it on the record as the cook, never the wife, but the cook. And you would see in these situations later that uh, you would see the, the, the female and the male. The male would be white. The, uh, female would either be mulatto or black. But in the next, when the census started coming along, then you would see the same male with this female, but at this time she would be the cook and they would have four or five children. The children would be mulatto and so forth. And many of the current families, both black and white in these areas, are, are, are the progenitors from these children. So I thought I would mention that um, because of the fact that we do have a very, and have always had a very multicultural and multiracial, actually I always said triracial uh, uh, population here, whether 
we wanted to admit it or not. And here again, uh, this is why it's always been called the cradle of the colony because most of the uh, migrants that came into the country uh, mixed for whatever reasons, uh, some uh, desired and some not desired, but we are here because of that. I think it also gave you a much stronger genetic pool because of the fact that the Europeans had a habit of marrying their first cousins and so forth, and sometimes they would end up with some very serious genetic problems. And I always tell them when they ask that one thing that the African Americans and Native Americans did for the Europeans was to strengthen their gene pool, which was getting a little thin. I don't know whether I was supposed to say that, but everybody know I said what I want. Um, in terms of uh, next, we have the first African Americans that came in the area were treated as indentured servants. I keep focusing on indentured servants because of the fact that the first slaves that came in 1619 came on boats as slaves, but when they got here the, and were sold, they were treated as indentured servants which meant that in three to seven years, if they didn't make anybody mad and followed everything, they would be given their freedom along with sometimes up to 300 acres of land, and they could go and sell other places, and this is what they did. And sometimes I think we forget to emphasize that, yeah, they, they were captured by pirates and so forth, which is what really was the situation. Most of them were cap captured by pirates, and they were coming from Barbados and those areas. And by the way, we have a lot of European here from the plantation families and so forth that are tied to the Barbados. And they also helped set up the uh, slavery structure in 1715 and up to 1760 that uh, was used in this geographical area. And this is one of the major contributions in relationship to uh, what goes on in the country now came here. It's, it, it's considered a negative contribution, but I did want to give everybody credit for what they did, whether it was positive or negative. Um, the uh, the triracial nature of the African Americans also uh, created another situation which I alluded to earlier about the fact that they intermarried uh, with the whites. In fact, most of them married with the whites. So just about anywhere you go here in this area, if you take a genetic uh, or DNA test, you will find the surnames of a lot of people, both black and white, uh, that uh, fall in that category. And I'm going to give you uh, two examples of, of this. You have the Basemo family that started here, but then it became uh, Bertie. So in Bertie County, the Basemo name, surname is carried by both the blacks and the whites there. The ones that look white and the ones that look black are all from the same uh, uh, white male, the two white male. Uh, the first white male came in and took a um, uh, African American slave as his wife. Back then, they could marry. By the way, it wasn't against the law. And then, when she died, he married a white female. So this is where you come up with a set of um, African American, uh, all children with African descent, because a lot of them did not look like African and then you come up with the ones that were white. And they all still live in the same geographical area. They all turn out to uh, uh, be very prosperous and so forth and have a lot of control on what goes on in Bertie County. So when you go in Bertie County and look around, I always tell the people to be careful uh, about who you talk about because they you may be talking to somebody else's relative. And then sometimes when things get a little rough and people uh, get to act with too much racial animosity. I have been known to say, be careful, you may be talking about yourself. And then that makes a puzzle look come on their face. Uh, so I always tell people, 
that you can uh, always have fun uh, with a put down, especially when people don't know what you're doing. And I thought I would share that with you. Um, the other thing I want to mention also is the fact that a lot of important people have come from Chawan and Bertie County as a result of that. Uh, you have two presidents who were not identified as uh, of African descent who were president of the United States. So Barack Obama is the first documented one uh, that's been admitted, but he is not the first one. I thought I would share that with you. After you heard everything I said today, um, I, I won't leave the assumption that you might realize that I'm just saying that is actually the situation. And uh, we know where the house is for one of those uh, uh, presidents that was here. Um, now, I'm going to uh, end uh, with, and if I have time, I may say a few more things, but I do want to get this out. We had a 1619 uh, emphasis on the uh, uh, first slaves in this country. And I'm talking about the ones that were indentured servants, but they came as slaves on the pirate ships, and then when they got off, uh, they were bought and then treated as indentured servants. There was a John Punch, P-U-N-C-H, who uh, was an indentured servant. And he decided to run away. He was in Virginia, and then he ran to Maryland and got caught. And when he came back, the judge gave him a sentence of life in bondage. So he technically became the first uh, African-American slave in this country that had lifetime, that, that was a lifetime sentence. Okay, well, he got lucky. The person that bought him was very rich, but didn't have any children. And his wife died, and he outlived his wife, so when he died, he left John Punch, his entire state. So John Punch went from being a slave to one of the wealthiest uh, persons of African descent in Virginia. He married a white female, so therefore the children, technically, uh, the ones that could pass, became white, and the others were mulatto. They all, the, the ones that were white stayed in Virginia. The others went, and he had land here in this area. He had land in South Carolina and in Tennessee. That's how much wealth he had. And so, uh, to make a long story short, uh, the people uh, came, that came here turned out to be artisans. So if you see the word B-U-N-C-H, and somebody said they built this house or whatever. Over in Bertie, we, they, we have five or six uh, important houses that were built by the bunch, the bunches that I'm talking about. And what I have done is put up an exhibit, had an exhibit put up on those houses. And I have also developed biographical notes on their relationships. In researching this and doing this, I found out that uh, Barack Obama's mother is from this group here in Bertie County. So I have a picture of Barack Obama up there with his great, great, great grandfather. I kept on looking and then I found out that you all have heard of uh, Ralph Bunch who was in the United Nations and was the first African American to receive a Nobel Prize. Guess what? He is from this same bunch, uh, uh, Jeremiah Bunch, over in Bertie County. Is his great, 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 great. Okay, not gonna stop there. I said, well, let me go here and see what else I can find. And so the current, after uh, uh, the current secretary of the Smithsonian Institution, who is an, who identifies himself as an African American. Uh, family came, he was actually born in Bertie County, and then they migrated to New Jersey. But the Smithsonian, 
he is the first secretary of the Smithsonian. And uh, he also was the first director of the Smithsonian National African American Museum. Okay, I think I have said enough at that point, but there is one more thing that I want to say. The person who headed the genetic project for the uh, Bunch family heard about some stuff I was doing and he got on the phone and I had him to come down and talk about the connection of the families uh, from here and he lives in Eugene, Oregon. The thing, a lot of people did not believe this, but what made everybody mouth gas was when I introduced him, a young man from here in Chihuahua County stood up and said, my name is Mark Bunch too. His name was Mark Bunch. The Mark Bunch who stood up, everybody gasped because they looked like identical twins. So we know for sure that Mother Nature was not making a joke. They definitely uh, were connected. And I think I'll stop there and uh, be glad to on Thursday entertain questions as part of our question and answer session. Thank you for the opportunity for me to be here. Thank you very much.